Welcome to the ACLU of Washington's Virtual Flights and Rights. Our moderator is Michelle Storms, Executive Director of the ACLU of Washington. Feel free to submit questions once Michelle, Jamie, and Anoka have moved into their moderated conversation. Michelle, you may begin. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the next hour. My name is Michelle Storms. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Executive Director at the ACLU of Washington. I am so excited to welcome you to our very first virtual Flights and Rides. Now, typically we hold these events in breweries and event spaces around the state, and most often in the gathering space of KEXP 90.3 FM in Seattle. That's KEXP.org <laughs> everywhere else in the world. We thank KEXP for sharing music and reminding us that we are not alone, not ever, not even during this isolating time of COVID-19. Now, typically also a local brewery pours the flights to go with our rights. We are so grateful for their generosity over the past few years and for many more to come. During this hiatus, please visit aclua.org and click aclu-wa.org and click on tonight's event. You'll see a list of partner breweries, including those who are offering pickup and gift certificates right now. I invite you if you are able to support them. Washington State is home to 29 Native tribes. Tonight, the speakers and I join you from the occupied territory of the Coast Salish people. We remember that Indigenous people were lied to, treaties were broken, and their land was stolen. We recognize this to honor our truth and our commitment to fighting for justice for all. Acknowledgement is a critical and necessary step toward honoring Native communities and having a larger conversation on decolonization and reconciliation. And we also acknowledge this is not the first of frightening diseases that have ever been introduced to Native communities. The Chief Seattle Club is a local organization in Seattle that provides a safe and sacred place to rest, revive, and nurture the spirit of urban Native people in need. They remind us that our homeless community will suffer at higher rates during this COVID-19 pandemic, and that Native people are 10 times more likely to experience homelessness in King County and are incredibly vulnerable to COVID-19. I encourage you then, if you're able, to give to the Chief Seattle Club and other organizations serving Native people. These organizations need as much help as possible right now. There's so much that we, along with the experts, are still learning about the novel coronavirus. But what we know for sure is that while the virus itself does not discriminate, the impact will fall disproportionately on the shoulders of the most vulnerable Americans, indigenous people, people of color, people experiencing poverty, people experiencing homelessness, immigrants, and people behind bars. We're also learning devastatingly how the virus is taking black lives in disproportionate numbers. Since the start of the COVID-19 outbreak in Washington state, we at the ACLU have been monitoring federal, state, and local responses to our current public health crisis. We don't do this work alone. In coordination with many local allies, our national ACLU office and ACLU affiliates across the country, we have taken action to assure that responsive measures from the government follow public health experts' recommendations and protect the health, safety, and the civil liberties of all of us. So far, the ACLU has filed 29 lawsuits related to the coronavirus. Now we're here tonight to dive deeper into what the ACLU of Washington is doing to lessen the impact of the pandemic on our most vulnerable people. This is part one of two. So please save the date for the second part on April 23rd, where we'll take a closer look at privacy and technology in the time of the coronavirus disease, as well as our advocacy to minimize the impact on young people facing juvenile detention, students with disabilities, and people experiencing homelessness. Tonight, I'm joined by Inoka Harat and Jamie Hawk, our staff who are working so hard to protect our immigrant friends and neighbors, as well as incarcerated folks and people being held in detention centers. So let me tell you who they are. First, I welcome Inoka Herat, who is our ACLU Police Practices and Immigration Council. Inoka joined the ACLU of Washington staff in 2017 in direct response to the Trump administration's attacks on immigrant rights. 
She previously worked at the Washington Defender Association's Immigration Project, where she supported public defenders in navigating the immigration consequences of criminal offenses. Inoka graduated from the University of Washington Law School and served as judicial clerk at the Seattle Immigration Court for two years with the Department of Justice's Honors Program. She is a former president of the South Asian Bar Association of Washington and was formerly on the boards of One America and API Chaya. Inoka is the proud child of Sri Lankan immigrants and lives in Beacon Hill with her husband and two children. When she's not homeschooling her two kids, which a lot of people are doing these days, Inoka's job is to expand and enforce the civil rights of immigrants and to ensure state and local institutions do not aid the Trump administration's agenda of mass deportations. Next, I'd like to introduce ACLU's Legal Strategy Director for Smart Justice, Jamie Ha. Jamie's passion for criminal legal reform was shaped by nearly a decade's work helping clients through the criminal legal system as a state and federal defender. Jamie began her legal career working on immigration and civil rights as a fellow on the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee staff of Ted Kennedy. She continued her work in criminal justice at the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts in Washington, D.C., as a legal observer to the military tribunal proceedings in Guantanamo Bay. Jamie serves on the National Council of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section and the Washington State Bar Association Council on Public Defense. A graduate of Gonzaga University School of Law, Jamie is an enthusiastic Zags basketball fan and loves to travel. Jamie's job is to reduce over-incarceration and reform the criminal legal system through legal and policy strategies. A major focus of her work is reforming our state's pretrial detention system, which keeps people locked up simply because they lack money to pay bail. Right now, of course, both Inoka and Jamie are working hard to keep immigrants and people behind bars healthy and safe. So each of them is going to share some information with you about the advocacy they're doing in the COVID-19 space. And when they're done, all three of us will come together for a conversation. And at that time, please jump in with questions whenever you'd like. You can type your questions in the Q&A section and folks will make sure that I see those. So let's get started with Inoka. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for showing up today and for caring about others and justice during this time when we're all just really trying to survive a new normal. And thank you for giving me a reason to dress up today, which feels very special, first time in a long time. Um, here at the ACLU of Washington, our immigration work in the time of coronavirus falls into three categories that I'll discuss today. Immigration enforcement, detention, and federal and local relief efforts. The bottom line is, as Michelle said, that COVID-19 doesn't discriminate. It doesn't check status. It impacts all of us. We really are all in this together. And our country has the choice to protect people, to bend history towards a caring and beloved community. But Trump instead continues to use his power to harm people and risk lives. We cannot allow Trump to undermine our nation's response to this pandemic by further attacking immigrants and communities of color. So, you know, we want people to get tested and to get care and to work in essential fields and to go to the grocery stores and to feed their families. ICE should ensure individuals are not afraid to do those things. So do we demand that they immediately suspend any civil immigration enforcement activities. Luckily in Washington, we have prevented our local institutions from collaborating through multiple state legislative efforts, including passing the Keep Washington Working Act last year and just last month, the Courts Open Call Act, which I know that many supporters helped um, advocate for. These make it unlawful for Washington's law enforcement, prosecutors, and other government officials from facilitating these arrests. So that's a good start. But unfortunately, enforcement continues. A few weeks ago, when California started sheltering in place, there was an LA Times article showing ICE officers wearing masks and arresting people in their homes. And last week, our allies at the Yakima Immigrant Rights Network documented ICE deportation flights, which leave through Yakima with buses from the Northwest Detention Center and flights full of people not wearing masks. It's appalling. Thankfully, we are seeing a reduction in ICE arrests. But nevertheless, ICE has arrested hundreds of people in Washington since early March. 
The date of arrests also shows that this enforcement has largely occurred over weekends when people are at home or close to home, doing exactly what people should be doing right now. And that is very concerning. So our first ask is deem ICE non-essential, hashtag non-essential. Moreover, when ICE or Border Patrol arrest people, what happens to them? Most are placed in immigration detention. Here in Washington State and in the region, it's the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, Washington that people um, are detained in for immigration. And as a reminder, immigration detention is civil, not criminal. It is not a punishment for a crime. The reason people are detained is so that they show up for immigration court. That's the government's interest in immigration detention. But the government has other options for ensuring people go to court, especially at this time. So our second ask is ICE and Border Patrol should release all people in their custody. These agencies lack the expertise, equipment, and training necessary to prepare for and address a COVID-19 outbreak. Without a cure, without a vaccine, our only defense against this virus is social distancing. And that is impossible to do in a detention setting. We don't trust ICE. We don't trust that they are honoring social distancing or that they're testing people or have the ability to care for the many people who may fall ill. And that's not just because they act like a rogue agency. We've worked with our allies at La Resistencia to reach people in detention or who have been recently released from detention and they have told us their firsthand stories. So we sued. We, along with the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, NERP, sued ICE and GEO, the private company that runs the NWDC, to release nine people who, because of medical complications, are at high risk of death if they con contract COVID-19. We were the first in the country to do so, and I'm really proud of our team's effort. From our lawsuit, we learned that ICE has reduced the population at NWDC by half. So now there are about 800 or so people in detention in Tacoma. But that means that there are still about five, 50 or so people sharing space in each of the pods. To show that they were socially distancing, ICE took the square footage of their facility and divided it by the number of people detained and said, see, everyone gets over 30 square feet of space to socially distance. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and yet, um, you know, over the past three years that I've been doing this work here at the ACLU, I've been really proud of the ways that people with power all over Washington in red counties and blue, from lawmakers to sheriffs to bureaucrats and government agencies, how they have time and again in ways big and small, use their power to do what's right and what's compassionate and what's just. And when this webinar was scheduled, I was hoping I could tell you that the judge in our case did just that. But sadly, yesterday afternoon, um, we found out that he issued an order denying our case, that he prioritized ICE's interest in detaining people to show up for their immigration hearings over the risk to their lives. He, just like ICE, is waiting for the worst case scenario. But lawsuits do bring more attention to an issue, and ICE has released four out of our nine plaintiffs so far. So our fight is not yet over. And in the meantime, similar lawsuits have been brought all over the country, and federal judges in San Diego and San Francisco, Pennsylvania, and New York have ordered ICE to release people. So far, ICE has 37,000 people in detention, and they're planning on releasing maybe 600. So we have to keep fighting. And in one such order, a judge recognized that, quote, this is an unprecedented time in our nation's history, filled with uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. But in the time of a crisis, our response to those at particularly high risk must be with compassion and not apathy. The government cannot act with a callous disregard for the safety of our fellow human beings, end quote. So another response is possible, and we are gonna keep fighting. And at the local level, I'm working with my colleague Jamie and allies like Columbia Legal Services um, and Spokane Immigrant Rights Coalition to call on local county jails to suspend or terminate contracts with ICE. ICE contracts with jails across the state to detain immigrants before they are taken to the NWDC in Tacoma. And under our state law, Keep Washington Working, these contracts must end in 2021. But we're asking local officials to suspend or terminate their contracts with ICE early to, to reduce overall exposure risks for people in jails and prison and officers and staff. It's also important to remember that immigrants in Washington are essential workers and are essential to our communities. 
And yet, simply because of their status, they were cut out of federal provisions to ensure COVID-19 testing and care, as well as economic relief, undermining our collective safety and economic future. Even though undocumented workers pay taxes and contribute to the state's pr prosperity, they are ineligible for the main governmental economic relief programs that already existed, and Congress has just excluded them from the relief packages passed to sustain millions of workers facing mass unemployment and even from covered testing. So they are excluded from unemployment insurance and from the stimulus checks. And these exclusions make paid work the sole lifeline for so many undocumented families. Our core partners in the immigrant rights movement, the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, NERP, and others have been inundated with calls for support from immigrant communities across the state. So we're calling for local action in light of the federal government's failure. While our state has filled some of the gaps to provide undocumented people with health coverage for testing and care, our third ask is calling for cities and the state to set up funds for undocumented people in order to cover housing, food, and other essential needs. We are working to protect the privacy of undocumented persons so that their information can't later be used for immigration enforcement, for simply doing the things we all need to be doing to survive this pandemic right now. So those are our top three demands and areas of work um, under the new normal. And I'll pass it on to Jamie. Thanks. Good evening, all. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. I wish I could see all of you, but I'm grateful that we're able to connect virtually in this difficult time. Thank you for your support and interest in our work to respond to COVID-19 and protect those incarcerated in jails, prisons, and detention centers. First, um, I'd like to share some updates about our jail advocacy and then uh, turn to the prisons. Uh, these past several weeks, we've been confronted with the most significant public health crisis in our lifetime. It's been a difficult and scary time for everyone, especially for those most vulnerable who are locked up in small, confined spaces around many other people. Unlike most of us, they have no ability to distance and protect themselves. Pandemics have consistently had some connection to spreading in jails and prisons due to these conditions and uncontrollable outbreaks. This is why we have argued along with numerous medical experts and allies for the past several weeks that there is a public health necessity to reduce jail and prison populations. Jail and prisons are particularly ill-suited to address the current pandemic. According to state and federal centers for disease control, correctional institutions pose special risks and considerations due to the nature of their unique environment. People who are incarcerated are extremely vulnerable demographic when it comes to a communicable disease, particularly COVID-19. Most of the jails in Washington are frequently near capacity and in some places routinely over capacity, forcing those in custody to be housed in extreme proximity. Double sink congregate living areas and dormitory housing exist throughout many of our jails. For example, in the King County Jail, there's dormitory housing with up to 20 inmates in a single dorm and eight closely located dorms and a single jail wing, the total capacity of 160. This is a common part of the design and operation of some jails. Residents have limited access to medical care that is not equipped to deal with the virus. Further, many of the individuals who are in custody in jail around the state have underlying health conditions or over the age of 50 or both which is why they are at a higher risk of serious illness or death if exposed to COVID-19. As many have emphasized, these issues are truly a matter of life or death for those incarcerated. We're working closely and tirelessly with allies and criminal legal system stakeholders to safely and significantly reduce our jail and prison populations as much as possible to stop the spread of COVID-19. We're 
to talk a little bit about our jails and the pretrial population. Um, not everyone may know the difference between jails and prisons. Jails are usually in each county to hold people on a sentence of less than one year or while they're awaiting trial and being detained pretrial. In fact, approximately 70% of most of uh, those locked up in our jails are being detained pretrial. This means they have not been convicted, they're presumed innocent, and they're simply waiting for their trial dates. They're held on money bail, they don't have the ability to pay. Counties manage their respective jails and prisons are managed by the state and house people who have been sentenced to more than one year. I wanna talk to you about some of the progress we're making in reducing our county jail populations. With trial dates being continued several weeks out uh, into, into May and perhaps even June and July and later this summer, the pretrial detention period for those who are presumed innocent will be extended a minimum of seven or eight weeks and likely much longer. In many cases, this will pre present significant pressure for folks to plead guilty to simply get out of jail and be reunited with their families. And in some cases, people could even serve a longer period of time being held pretrial on a low level misdemeanor um, than they could uh, if they just pled guilty or that the larger um, sentencing range allows. The extraordinary circumstances of this pandemic and outbreak warrant broad review of pretrial detention and the amount of bail imposed in hundreds of cases statewide. With our allies, we've sent advocacy letters to government and judicial leaders with recommendations to significantly reduce jail populations, limit any new arrests and bookings of people coming into the jails, and for necessary protocols to mitigate the risk of exposure to as many individuals in correctional custody as possible. We've urged counties to promptly identify and release individuals who are at risk and most vulnerable to infection, including individuals over 50 or with serious medical conditions, um, including heart disease or diabetes or other types of, of challenging medical needs. And in response, I'm excited to share that there really has been some significant progress around the state. A few thousand people have been released from county jails due to this emergency. Here in King County, the total jail population has been reduced from 1,900 at the beginning of last month to under 1,300 today. More than 600 people have been released in the past two to three weeks. In Snohomish County, the jail population has been cut in half. The jail was over 800 earlier last month and is down to 320 today. In Spokane and Yakima counties, similar reductions down um, closer to in the 30% range. At a minimum, the goal for jails should be to reduce the population down to single cells to everyone who remains in custody to allow significant distancing um, and protection for everybody in custody. Public defenders and defense attorneys around the state have been doing extraordinary work, filing motions for bail reductions and pretrial release and advocating for release in light of this pandemic that's had significant impact um, on these reductions that I just reported. And stakeholders around the state, um, county leaders have come together um, in several places to identify those most vulnerable and start releasing them. So we've seen significant progress and we're continuing to push. There still remains many people locked up who should and can be safely released into the community. Um, now I'd like to spend a little bit of time just talking about our prisons and some of the advocacy um, underway there. As I mentioned, prisons are run by the state and making progress toward the release of people in our prisons has really been a challenge. Um, unfortunately, we've seen very limited um, action or progress to report of the upwards of 18,000 people who are confined in our state prisons around the state. The COVID-19 
public health emergency continues to escalate uh, throughout Washington state. An outbreak that we and our allies have been warning about for weeks has begun in one of our prisons, um, the Monroe, Monroe uh, Correctional Complex. At least six people currently living in, in Monroe Prison um, in the minimum security unit and five DOC staff who work at MCC have now tested positive for COVID-19. This outbreak has, has finally led to some action um, by the state just in the last hour and a half before I logged in for, for this um, conversation. I was watching TVW and the governor and Secretary Sinclair uh, had uh, a press release um, sharing that they're starting to identify some groups that can be released, um, starting with um, nonviolent um, drug offenses, folks who are over um, 65 years old. So it's um, it's promising to see this step by the governor and the administration. But um, you know, tragically, it's taken this outbreak um, and some disruption and difficult um, times in the prisons um, to see this little bit of action. Folks incarcerated in our prisons are, are truly terrified. They're getting very limited information about the pandemic and how to protect themselves. And it's, um, it's a very, very, uh, a tragic and difficult time right now. Uh, the current population of our prisons make social distancing, um, physical and logistical impossibility. Um, thousands or hundreds of folks are housed um, and particularly vulnerable to a massive outbreak um, if COVID-19 occurs. Dr. Mark Stern, who teaches at UW School of Public Health and was former with, formerly with Washington DOC's Assistant Secretary of Health, warns that jails and prisons are like nursing homes and cruise ships and er has been urging for weeks for our prisons to be downsized and that and just really warning um, how rapidly the virus could spread throughout the population and result in many being hospitalized with complications. Um, so it's critical that we keep the pressure on and continue advocating and urging for significant reductions um, in our prison population as well. And for those who may have joined us in um, February for Flights and Rights, we, uh, ACLU of Washington, released a report called About Time, how long and life sentences fuel mass incarceration in Washington State. And we have a lot of data. We work with uh, amazing UW professors, Dr. Beckett and Dr. Evans, to look at 30 years of sentencing data here in Washington and really identify what many of the drivers of our aging prison population, why so many people who are frail and elderly continue to be locked up in our prisons around Washington. Over 20% are, are 50 and older in Washington, and a high high percentage have a various um, range of medical conditions and needs that the prisons are, are ill-equipped to address. And so if as the virus spreads and more people are infected, it's truly, truly a dangerous and, and very um, concerning time. So for our, our February flights and rights, we had some of our allies come who are doing incredible work in this area and uh, talked about uh, many of these issues before we knew about the COVID outbreak and, and how dire the impacts could be. And I want to lift up and highlight um, our friends at Columbia Legal Services have filed litigation in the Washington Supreme Court um, as a result of the lack of action and reductions that are so critical in this time um, in our prisons. And so there's litigation pending, um, and we are supporting them and numerous other allies in the form of amicus briefs. That litigation uh, is, is, is pending right now before the Supreme Court. Arguments are coming up later this month. And and uh, a motion for uh, emergency response was filed by Columbia Legal just this morning to address some um, of the concerns that have been um, happening um, at Monroe and, and some of the fear and concern that, that so many inside um, are faced with. So we've sent advocacy letters and a proposed executive order. Um, we've got some other actions online that folks can take, but we're continuing to keep the pressure on and really try to engage um, um, statewide to have more action from the governor and, and DOC. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there and just thank you again so much um, for joining us this evening and um, for your advocacy. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, both of you, uh, Jamie and Inoka. And um, so right now we're just going to move into a conversation with the three of us. And I want to, again, let those of you who are watching know that you can put questions into the comment box and folks are going to get those to me. Um, I've gotten a couple of already, but I actually want to start with one of mine because I think that um, you all, um, well, when we think about vulnerability, what's happening right now at Monroe Correctional um, Center is, is exactly our worst fears realized. And Jamie, I believe you've had the opportunity to talk with some family members of folks who are being, who are incarcerated there. And I wonder if you have anything you could share about what you're hearing from family members. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So understandably, family members are, uh, so concerned and just really afraid that their loved ones uh, will be infected. And they, uh, even just today, after what happened uh, yesterday evening at Monroe, they're hearing, uh, or they're, they're having increased difficulty communicating with their loved ones, which is a great concern uh, in terms of emails through JPay and um, being able to get phone calls. Uh, it's been a, a real challenge um, just trying to uh, stay current on, on, on what's happening. And they're also very concerned about the conditions inside the prisons. We um, were hearing that folks were being provided, even just sanitary hygiene um, uh, materials and ways to, to keep themselves safe. Uh, it's been a real issue. They were provided with some things that weren't alcohol-based um, and just being taken to into chow hall and around meals. They're in, in very, very tight quarters. Social distancing is nearly impossible. And um, it's just, it's it's very difficult. So they're concerned about all of those issues and have been doing lots of incredible advocacy to try to get DOC to, to take action. Thank you. Inoka, I am going to get to you, but I, I do wanna um, address something else to Jamie. And this is something that came in from the audience um, about folks who are being released, which at this point is primarily from the jails. But what do we know about what support awaits them when they get out? Because um, that has an impact on their ability to stay safe and healthy as well and to be able to succeed. Right, yes, thank you for that question. Um, you know. I know the most about here in King County, and I know that there's some other really great work in other counties and the community coming together uh, to support folks who are, who are being released. But want to really uh, give a shout out and lift up the work of our friends at PDA, the Public Defender Association. They uh, run the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And in this uh, terrible pandemic time, they have been working incredibly hard to to try to provide some case management and resources to folks as they're being released and assist with housing or medical needs or um, food and any, any other things that um, are coming up for folks that may not have family and loved ones to be released to. So that's been um, really wonderful. So they've been really trying to shift their model and the great work that they do around LEAD every day to really focus on a lot of these folks who are pre-trial and, uh, and being released out of the county jails. Thank you. So Jamie, I'm going to put a thought out for you and ask you to sit with it. Um, and uh, then I'm going to turn to Enoka. So there are a number of questions that are coming in. And this is that relate to something that we think about and talk about a lot, which is what is the relationship or what are the implications of some of the changes that are happening right now to our long-term reform? So for example, we have a lot of people who are being released from jail and one person says, well, are we gonna have any way of measuring the public safety impact to, to make the point that cash bail actually isn't necessary? And what are some of the other things that we're gonna find ourselves learning from this time where we have released people due to this unfortunate pandemic, but, 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 but in a space where this is something that we have advocated for for a long time, that in this mass incarceration state, we have people who are locked up who don't actually need to be. So I want you to just think for a moment about the long-term reform implications. And then I wanna to turn to Inoka and 
ask you a little bit about some of the stories as well, because when um, our organization first reached out to the detention center and said, we are creating this space of a hotbed of virus spread, potentially, please release people, and then they didn't, and then we sued, and then they also didn't right away. But you were hearing some stories from folks about what they were experiencing and what their fears and concerns were, and I'd love if you could share a little bit of that. Sure. Um, I mean, similar to some of the, the points that Jamie made, people in the Northwest Detention Center are arranged in pod settings, and so they're in these congregate settings. And um, the comparison to a cruise ship has been made um, in that context as well, where um, you know people eat together, they share bathrooms and showers, and they and um, there isn't disinfecting in between. You know, and so it's really difficult to maintain. Um, it's it, it really is sort of impossible <laughs> to maintain um, the kind of social distance that is being required of everyone else, um, and the kind of um, disinfecting and hygiene that is necessary in order to um, stave off this virus. Thank you. And I'll note so, um, with the, our allies, La, La Resistencia is really helping people also when they are being released to make sure that they can um, connect with their family and get some support so that they need to also be able to succeed and stay safe. Thank you. That's really critical. So two other things sort of related to, well, one related to the detention center. Um, uh, this question about is the idea that the Northwest Detention Center would stay at 800 detainees? Um, and then the second thing that I want you to uh, cover is, if you know, how did our Washington state representatives vote on the stimulus package that excluded um, vulnerable immigrant populations? Um, for the first one, that's what the current level is at around 800 right now. Um, that's not, we don't believe that that's safe for people. And so we want that number to be drastically reduced. Actually, we, we believe that, that that I should release everyone um, because the context doesn't lend itself to be a safe environment. Um, and and we're also thinking not only of the people who are in detention, but also of the guards, the staff who are coming in and out, um, and also the community around Tacoma who, that will have to deal with this. And so as um, guards and staff you know, enter the facility and then go back into the community, um, you know, there is spread that way. And of course, um, for the detention center to sort of be this Petri dish and then not have the capacity to uh, provide safety if there is an outbreak, that just puts that much more pressure on our local facilities in Tacoma and Pierce County. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of concern there. Um, so we really... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and not to mention our public health system, which we're already learning is uh, not as strong as it should be. Right, right. And so um, we're hoping that those numbers decrease. And one way to decrease them is by releasing people. Another is to just stop enforcement <laughs> to begin with so that people aren't being brought into detention. Um, then there was another ask about stimulus packages that, that uh where Im immigrants have been excluded, you know, that is, there have been a number of political compromises that we see in these bills and immigrants has definitely been one of them. I know that our, um, especially um, our senators have been pushing for, uh, and other members of our congressional delegation name, I mean, to be explicit, the Democrats on our um, delegation have been pushing to include immigrants um, in these packages and it's just been it's it's been that's just something that has not made it through um and at the same time there's so much pressure to provide um some security and and stimulus and benefits for everyone else and so um so yeah because of that political compromise uh immigrants have really been excluded unfortunately so um, I'm also going to leave you with a question, Inoka, to think about while I turn back to Jamie. So 
uh, this is not really specifically COVID-19 related, but in terms of asylees, people who are presenting themselves at the border to seek asylum, who are being turned away, I guess uh, the question is, how can the federal government do that? What's going on? And how does that comport with not only our standards of immigration law, but just sort of our standard and ethos as a country and, and who we are? So I want you to sit with that. And Jamie, I, I left you with a big question before, um, but I have a little one before you get into that. And the little one is, do we by any, do we do we have the racial breakdown of people who have been released from jails? Does anybody have that information? We don't no, have it. No, I, I wish we did. I've been okay. uh, reaching out to many of the defender offices to see things have been happening so quickly and in the, at the county level as well. And I'm just not sure they're unfortunately uh, monitoring and tracking that data. But that was one of our audience. Yeah, right. That was one of our audience questions, which I really appreciate and probably something that we need to uh, think about and see how we can advocate for that to happen. So now some wow. of these big picture reform questions, Jamie, um, what is uh, our ability to safe re safely release people tell us about um, our current criminal legal system and about our long term reform efforts? <laughs> it tells us a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, if we are able to, as, as we have been calling for for almost five years now with the launch of our Smart Justice campaign and pushing to dismantle mass incarceration around this country and eliminate racial disparities, and we set a big goal of 50%, of but really we want 100% um, reduction in jails and prisons. But as we've been fighting for this these last several years, it's it's... It's um, tragic that it's taken these circumstances in this pandemic, but to be in this place where we have county jails within two weeks time, being able to release 50% of the population with more to go and many more releases on the horizon, right? Like what, what does that tell us? Um, and we know that a lot of those folks are detained pretrial who if, if our court rule was consistently followed and we truly had a meaningful presumption of release, they would be out. They've never Never would have been in the jail to begin with. We've got a lot of folks on misdemeanors, felony charges too, on lower level um, or low small amounts of bail. And so I'm in the process now, things have been happening so quickly to get my hands on as much data and really try to dig into like King County, for example, over 600 people released from both jails over these last couple of weeks. We know that a chunk of them were coming from DOC kind of held on technical uh, community custody violations. And the county rightfully said, we're not holding these folks, started to release them. That's good. Shutting down the work release program, that helped um, some folks too. And then a lot of just individual review and looking at bail amounts and saying, why is this person detained? Um, and really, so we we are excited. And um, the only positive thing about these terrible circumstances is really uh, trying to keep this momentum and figure out how do we maintain, how does we how does this help us? And we're Working with law enforcement and prosecutors and judges to say we've got to rethink our criminal legal system and even moving forward because there's concerns about future outbreaks down the road and thinking about um, our jail populations and needing to maintain you know much smaller populations we'll be able to really dig in and continue this advocacy and work at a county and a state level uh, to really build on these reductions and figure out how we can maintain them some um, um, allies in Spokane are already trying to dig in to the, the few hundred people that have been released there and start to track, um, you know, the low amounts of bail that they were held on, what they were charged with. And then if we can also measure, which what we've been advocating for for years with our pretrial and bail reform, are the improved outcomes um, that people get when they're released pretrial and they're able to stay in the community and stay with their families and stay working and getting services if they need them and how that impacts 
the accusations against them and the criminal charge and the lower sentence sometimes or avoiding jail altogether, the much better outcomes that their attorneys are able to achieve when they're not locked up and detained pretrial and pressured to plead guilty, right? So it's, it will be incredible. Another important measure of, of public safety and case outcomes is to see how many of these cases end up getting dismissed, shouldn't been charged to begin with, or the improved mm -hmm. outcomes for the folks accused. I know that we have a very educated audience, but I can't help but emphasize uh, that thing that you said a moment ago. And, and I believe that, um, and you can tell me if this isn't right, Jamie, that about 70% of the people who are in jail are there on pretrial, which means they have not been found to be guilty. And primarily when they're there because of bail, it is because they didn't have the money to pay for it because other people who had the money to pay for it are not in jail and they stay with their families and they stay in their jobs and don't lose their jobs, don't have disconnection from their family. And so this is so powerful. And again, it's a terrible reason that it's come about, right? Like this health pandemic, but at the same right. time really does point out uh, the injustice that takes place there. Um, exactly. Something that both of you, right? Something that both of you have referenced a little bit, but I want to zero on a particular thing with the Department of Corrections. Both of you have referenced that um, when we talk about the vulnerable populations who are in detention, who are incarcerated in prison and jails, and who are in these tiny spaces where truly social distancing is not an option, both of you have referenced that also there's prison staff, right? I mean, there's this, the people who work there and the implications of their health as well. And, and Jamie, you already pointed out that the first, um, the first people found to have COVID-19 at Monroe were staff. Has DOC spoken to that at all, um, their concern to, uh, for the uh, safety of prison staff and their families as well? Yes, I mean, they, they have, and, I, and I, they recognize that, you know, you can try to isolate folks or they, they cut down volunteers and family members. Uh, I, I volunteer at, at DOC and have a red badge and, and we were one of the first groups, and so do you, Michelle, to, to get cut <laughs> off. It makes sense so yeah. that we're, if we're carrying the virus, as we know, you can be asymptomatic for weeks then. So that, you know, unfortunately we, can, we can't go in right now to visit, but um, so they started to uh, cut all the visits and really close off anybody coming in, but the the staff, but there are you know, hundreds of people coming in and out of our prisons every day that could be carrying um, the virus in over this, these last several weeks. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think, you know, the governor and DOC, they are, they are concerned about the staff and their families as well, and, and the broader community and public, right, as this pandemic spreads, and now we have an outbreak at Monroe, and if, you know, hundreds of people, it could spread more. Um, there's a, a, a federal prison, I, I forgot the location, because I just read the headline today, there's over 200 people in one federal prison, like 50 or 60 staff, and somewhere around 250 people in the prison who now have tested positive. Um, oh and the, those again, are folks in BOP in federal custody. It's mm -hmm. just tragic. And I hope that Monroe doesn't get to that level, but at the, with the population as it is now, there's no way to separate people. And if they, they haven't brought the population down as they should have, and so then we don't know, and they're not testing. So it's hard to really know how many people are already have it right now. And, um, and that can spread to the staff as well. And, and, and then into the broader community, right? As they have to be taken from the prison into the hospital. And then it's just, um, you know, terrible situation. Thank you, Jamie. So true. So Enoka, wanted to come back to you about that asylum question. Are you ready? Yeah. Um, you know, this is even, this sort of predates uh, this epidemic, uh, pandemic, but for three years now, the Trump administration has been really um, doing things like, uh, turning away asylum seekers, forcing asylum seekers to stay in Mexico instead of coming here, um, uh, criminalizing people who are uh, coming to seek asylum. Um, and they've been doing all these things in violation of the law. 
And the ACLU, particularly the Southern California um, and, and those affiliates along the southern border, have been trying to hold this administration accountable. And we've sued time and time and time again. Um, and we'll continue doing that. Uh, unfortunately, we've been getting cases back from the U.S. Supreme Court that have really deferred to the administration on so many of their policies around this. Um, and I am, and my fear is that they will continue to do that. Um, so that's always, you know, that's always something that we have to sort of account for. But, you know, in terms of the international implications of all of, um, of our immigration law, it's not only the fact that we have played that role um, of being a place of safe haven for um, refugees and for asylum seekers from around the world. Um, but I'm really concerned about these deportation flights, you know, where people, um, and, and as Jamie said, you know, they're not testing. They're just simply not testing as many people as they should be in these detention centers. And so when they deport people and they put people on a crowded flight, you know, they're sending, they're spreading, they're, they're really contributing to the spread of this global pandemic. And that is incredibly irresponsible um, and shameful. Thank you, Inoka. So we're coming up on the close of our time, which has passed so very quickly. And so what I want to ask each of you before I have a few closing comments is um, if there's anything you want to let people know that they can be doing to support uh, the people who are impacted and support this advocacy, now would be a great time to, um, to bring that up. And also, um, yeah, and so that's, I think we're gonna just do that and then and then close out. Sorry, I'm looking at the chat box and talking to you and looking at my notes all at the same time. So, um, you know, if you wanna go ahead and start with, um, uh, you know, what, what you what you would put out for folks to be able to take action on. Sure, I feel like um, three things. One is around public education. And so um, something, some information that we're just trying to get out to everyone is that everyone, if they are feeling sick, they should stay home or go get care. Um, there is some concern in immigrant communities about what's known as a public charge rule, um, this recent change again by a very cruel and misguided um, administration um, to limit those who can apply for a green card to those who can really afford it, really. And um, it's not even that, to be wealthy, you know, and, and, um, and to be concerned that getting public assistance or getting any sort of assistance to access health care for uh, coronavirus or um, any other sort of benefits is going to impair that. And actually, ICE has said that um, you know any healthcare access used for this pandemic will not be used against applicants. So that's good. They also have said that they're not enforcing, they're not doing immigration enforcement in and around medical centers or facilities. So um, it's really important to let people know that um, you know they should get the care, they should seek the medical attention and care they need. Um, Another step is to join our um, our lister. I'm, sh I'm sure many of you are already. We are gonna be doing action alerts to try to put pressure. Since our litigation um, didn't result in an order from the judge at this moment, we are gonna try to put pressure and do advocacy um, to get ICE to change their policy and to release more people. So look out for action alerts related to that. Um, and then third, I would say is if you can donate, if you are still, um, able to and um and you know if you are still um keeping your salary and will be receiving some checks i really encourage you to donate there are um statewide funds that nerp and weissen and others have um combined for undocumented folks who have been excluded from these federal packages and there's also regional ones there's one in spokane with the spokane American rights Co um Spokane Immigrant Rights Coalition, and there's also one in Walla Walla, um, the Walla Walla Immigrant Rights Network. So please look into those um, efforts and, and yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, if it's not up yet, we're actually gonna have a page on our website that shares um, some of the places uh, where you can provide donations, where people are kind of on the front lines on the ground doing this critical work, supporting immigrants, supporting families of people who are incarcerated and other issues related to COVID-19. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's already up on our website now. So Jamie, what about you? What, what ways do you want people to take action based on the things that you've talked about? 
Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And thanks for mentioning it. We do have a COVID-19 response page up on our ACLU of Washington uh, site. So please go there. And a lot of the work that Anoka and I have talked about and these advocacy letters uh, are, are up there. And um, we're trying to provide uh, relevant updates for you so to track some of those as we continue to work with our partners and allies um, around jails and prisons and youth and the immigration detention center. Um, so that is a, a great place. And then I also wanted to mention our um, awesome comms team. We and Anoka mentioned also the action alerts, and our comms team um, has been working really hard to just stay on top of everything that's moving so quickly and providing opportunities for us all to really engage and and build um, political pressure uh, and getting uh, our government leaders to take the appropriate action in this time. And so we did over the weekend put out an action alert uh, to the governor around the prisons. And if you're able to take action and sign on, we've had a, a, a close to a couple thousand thousand people, but we'd like to make that, you know, a couple hundred thousand people and just really um, show that the, our communities statewide are calling for more releases and that we've got to get the, the population numbers down um, to keep folks inside and all of us um, safe and stop the spread of, of the virus. So, uh, and, and our action alert is focused on a proposed executive order for the governor that we've drafted mm -hmm. with Disability Rights Washington. And we give a lot of options um, for the governor to consider in different ways to uh, get the population down. A lot of folks that, that should be released right now. So we'd really appreciate your time weighing in and, and, and taking action in those ways. Um, and then as Anoka mentioned, uh, if, if you do want to do donate to everything that Anoka said, and then if you have a little bit left over and you also want to donate um, to the Northwest um, Community Bail Fund, they do uh, a lot of critical work both in King and Snohomish primarily, but trying to get into Pierce County as well. And so folks um, generally who are in on lower amounts of bail that just have absolutely no means to pay, they, they help um, um, get folks out who are in the jail pretrial. So, but no, we've done a lot of good work. We know there's still a lot of folks in um, that if they had the resources could get out and be safely with their, their families. So, so that's always a great uh, way to take action as well. So, and thank you all so much for joining us and continuing the fight for justice and uh, being with us tonight. Great. Thank you, Jamie. So actually, just before I make my closing remarks, um, that some attorney in the audience says, wait a minute, is there anything specifically an attorney can do? And so I think that Enoka had something she wanted to share about that. Sure, we've been hearing from um, a lot of our community partners that um, attorneys are really needed in terms of getting people, um, guiding people through the process of uh, unemployment getting unemployment, um, mm -hmm. making sure that they get their unemployment benefits. And then also for housing, we've been hearing so many instances of landlords um, who are also, who may also be desperate um, for cash, cash strapped, um, that they're putting a lot of pressure and threatening um, their tenants, which, you know, there's been a moratorium um, or a temporary at least um, on evictions. And, and so, you know, having, being able to volunteer as a pro bono attorney uh, um, for those kinds of legal aid clinics um, have, for around housing and unemployment right now would be really, is there's a huge need. Great, thank you so much, Enoka. And for those of you who registered, we're gonna be able to um, uh, send you links. So you can um, stay put links to our COVID response page to our, um, uh, just to all the different ways that you can help. So just to uh, close this out today, um, I wanna say thank you so much to Enoka and Jamie, um, who just bring so much passion and so much dedication and so much expertise into this work. Um, so grateful for you. 
And I'm so grateful to you who are in the audience. You know, we're used to our flights and rights where we're in the same room with people. And frankly, all that being used to being in the same room with people is something we're we're definitely in a new reality about all of that, right? So I'm used to cheering with you and clapping with you and feeling sorrowful with you, but I know you're out there. And I'm so glad that all of you came to listen, to educate yourself, to share your questions, and for just the work that you do in the community. We're grateful for your questions. We're grateful for your solidarity. And we're just grateful for your capacity to care. Care and compassion really matter right now. Um, many of you who are members or donors um, got our annual report this year, and there was this beautiful piece of artwork, a watercolor piece of artwork from a local um, Washington State artist named Marisol Ortega, and in it, and on this beautiful painting were the words, we are in this together, and that is something that we think about all the time in the work we do. But who knew how poignant and strong that would feel to us now that we're in this where there is really a lot of trauma and a little, a lot of um, pain and concern and anxiety and all the things that are present. So I'm really grateful um, to be in this with all of you. And then finally, I do just want to remind you, this was just part one of two. So I want you to check the website um, so that you can register for April 23rd when we'll talk about privacy and technology and our youth work and hopefully be able to give you some good updates um, um, on the state of affairs of the civil rights and civil liberties of Washingtonians. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, all of you. We'll see you in a few weeks and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>